Well, good morning, everyone. How's your week been? Did it involve washing your hands a lot, wearing a face mask and avoiding crowded places? How are you coping with the rules these days? We were on a holiday in Keswick a couple of weeks ago. The town wasn't as busy as usual, but there were still more people about than we've been used to. You could tell it was from Scotland, though. They were the ones who stepped aside to let you pass on the street. The ones who wore face masks in the shops and the ones getting a little bit annoyed and muttering under their breath. Why can't people observe the rules? Yes, we're living in times when following the rules is really important. Or if you like, sticking to the facts. Face coverings in enclosed spaces, avoiding crowded places, cleaning your hands and surfaces regularly, two meter distancing and self isolating if you have COVID symptoms. The facts are crucial right now, and we know why we're supposed to follow the rules to protect others and to keep ourselves safe. It's important stuff. But in today's passage, we find some facts that are even more important, even more significant than the facts shaping our lives at the moment. Facts that relate to our eternal well being. So let's have a look at Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23 together. The Pharisees and some teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered round Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it's written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can make them unclean by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that makes them unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can make them unclean? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what makes them unclean. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a person unclean. Let's pray together. Lord, open our eyes to see wonderful truths in your word this morning. Amen. Traditions, they're all around us. Some are good. Some feel outdated and some are just plain embarrassing. Like the man who discovered the church of long trousers in a remote corner of the world. On a taxi ride one day, he asked the driver if he was a Christian and the driver told him no. But the driver said he knew all about the Christians. They wore long trousers. But he and almost everyone in his culture wore robes. According to him, the missionaries there thought they looked too much like skirts, they were too feminine, 
So they convinced the converts to wear long trousers, even though Jesus likely wore robes. They had evaluated the local culture against their own Western standards and traditions, leading to ridicule and scorn. The Pharisees and teachers of the law loved their traditions. One day, as they're gathered around Jesus, hoping to hear him say something outrageous or do something controversial to add to their growing list of complaints against him, they notice that the disciples are eating food without washing their hands properly. This is what they've been waiting for. So they asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? You see, hand washing was all the rage among the Jews in the first century, too, but for completely different reasons, which we'll look at in a minute. The Pharisees are really annoyed. They may just be a little bit angry, complaining to Jesus that these people, the disciples, were breaking the rules and wanting to know what Jesus was going to do about it. Now, Jesus' response to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law is pretty strong, as strong as anything we've seen so far in the Gospel of Mark. He had been deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts earlier, but he seems to have decided that their continuing unbelief and fault finding needed to be challenged. He calls them hypocrites in verse six and quotes Isaiah 29, another time when God challenged the hypocrisy of his people. Here's what God said on that occasion. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. God's people had made a real mess of their religion. What should have been vibrant faith in a living God had been reduced to box ticking and empty rituals. The people could still be found in the temple courts, singing their songs of worship and offering the right sacrifices, but their hearts were not in it. Exactly the same thing was happening in Jesus' day. The Pharisees had made a real mess of their religion too. So what had gone wrong? Jesus uses three phrases to explain how they had managed to end up with empty, heartless religion. In verse eight, Jesus says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. In verse nine, he says, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And in verse 13, he says, you nullify the word of God by the tradition that you have handed down. Their man-made rules had become more important than the commands of God. And it's easy to do that, actually. And the question for us today is, how do we avoid making the same mistakes? I think we see two main lessons here, and we need to keep the facts that God has given us front and center. We need to hold on to God's word, not man's ways, and hand down God's truth, not man's traditions. So we hold on to God's words and not man's ways. Traditions, rules and procedures that are intended to help can often take on a life of their own and actually end up hindering us in our faith. One of the most guilt inducing traditions that I've struggled with over the years is the morning quiet time. Now, spending time with God each day in prayer and Bible study is the lifeblood of our faith. And plenty of Bible verses encourage us to develop that spiritual discipline. But we love to make it hard for ourselves, don't we? One of our former colleagues in OMF lived by the mantra, no Bible, no breakfast. And when I was growing up, there was a general feeling that if you missed your morning quiet time, you had let God down badly. I once did my Bible reading notes in the evening because I had to get up really early the next day to do something. But when I told one of my youth leaders about this, she told me off. The worst thing about the tradition of morning quiet times is that not everyone is very good in the mornings. I love the fact that James Hudson Taylor used to tell CIM missionaries, whatever is your best time in the day, give that to communion with God. Of course, the quiet time is, in essence, a good biblical idea. I think it was a bit like that with the Pharisees and the traditions of the elders. 
we frequently give the Pharisees a hard time, but it's worth remembering that they often did what they did with good intentions. In his commentary, Donald English says, they were genuine believers in God. They were concerned for the spiritual renewal of their people. And there were honorable men among them like Joseph of Arimathea, looking eagerly for the kingdom and diligent in prayer for it. We should neither be hard on them nor easy on ourselves. Well, the Pharisees essentially wanted to be clean, to be acceptable to God, so that they could go into the temple and worship the Lord, offer sacrifices and spend time with their family and friends. Because if you were unclean, you had to go into self-isolation for a few days and be temporarily excluded from the community of God's people. In the Old Testament law, there were lots of examples of how a person could become unclean and what they were to do about it. We see this in Leviticus in particular. And it looks like God gave these rules in order to protect his people, for many of them make good sense in terms of personal hygiene. But they also served as a reminder that Israel served a holy God who wanted his people to approach him with clean hands and a pure heart. It's possible that the cleansing rituals of the Pharisees emerged out of this desire to be clean before God. Now, the usual remedy for the unclean person was actually quite simple. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, says Leviticus 15 verse 6. And in fact, that phrase is re repeats several times through the chapter. So, for example, if a person had a, a bad case of diarrhea, they were said to be unclean, along with everything that they'd sat or laid down on. They were to self-isolate for seven days, wash their clothes and bathe with fresh water, after which they could come back before the Lord and make the appropriate offerings. But the problem was that the Pharisees had invented a whole bunch of extra rules. As Mark explains in verses three to four, they were to wash their hands in a particular way. Now, I don't suppose they sang happy birthday to themselves, but the words they used in the, in the passage here indicate that they had to wash their hands up to the wrist or, or perhaps with a fist involved or even just a fistful of water. There was something special about it. And they did that in order to avoid becoming unclean when they ate. And they were holding on to these traditions, their man-made rules, rather than the commands of God. And Jesus goes on to give an example. The setting aside of the fifth commandment was pretty disgraceful. There was clearly an understanding or expectation that the command to honour your father and your mother included taking care of them by providing for their needs. In a society with no social security system or pension provision, it was the children's responsibility to look after the parents. But someone had come up with a cunning plan. They noticed that there was a law in Numbers chapter 30 verses 1 and 2 stating that if you made a vow, you had to keep it. This is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but do everything he said. So they invented a rule that said, if you make a vow devoting your wealth to God, it can't be used for other means. They called this korban, which just means an offering to God. And the implication was that the, the gift you offer to God is holy and therefore not available for ordinary use, like supporting your parents. Now, the rule stated that you didn't have to give the money to God straight away, so you could continue to benefit from it, perhaps investing it and living off the interest while not having to give it to your parents. So the Pharisees used the command about vows being sacred to nullify the command about honoring your parents. Thus they played one scripture off against another for their own profit and created their own rules in order to justify it. And this was only one example. There were many others according to Jesus They'd done exactly the same thing with their ceremonial washing. They'd taken the Levitical command to, to wash and bathe with water, very simple, and invented further instructions and, and expanded its application. They thought that if they washed their hands in the right way, they would be clean, even though their hearts were still full of the evils listed in verses 20 
to 22. Well, Jesus called the crowd to him after he'd been speaking with the Pharisees and he exposed the folly of the teachers of the law once and for all when he said, it's not what goes into you that is important. It's what comes out of you that matters. The Pharisees were concerned about externals, but God is concerned about what's going on inside our hearts. They were doing all the right things, eating the right food, praying the right prayers, being seen in the temple with all their public acts of worship and devotion, whilst completely ignoring the clear biblical teaching that what God is looking for is a pure heart. The Pharisees were upset because the disciples had unclean hands. Jesus was distressed because the Pharisees had unclean hearts. And they weren't only making a mess of their religion for themselves, they were inflicting it on others too. So let's have a look at the the second lesson. Hand down God's truth, not man's tradition. Traditions. It's funny how they get started sometimes. A new wife watched her husband prepare to place a ham in the oven. He took a knife and carefully trimmed off both ends of the ham. The wife asked, why did you do that? I've never seen anyone cut off both ends of the ham before cooking it. The husband answered, you know, I don't really know, but that's the way my mother always did it. But now his curiosity had been aroused, so he called his mum and asked her why she always cut off both ends of the ham before she cooked it. Now that you mention it, I don't know, dear, his mother replied. That's just the way your grandmother always did it. Determined now to unravel this mystery, the young man telephoned his grandmother and asked her why she always cut off both ends of the ham before she cooked it. Well, love, said the grandmother, the first oven we owned wasn't big enough to put a whole ham in, so I had to cut both ends off to make it fit. As we've seen already in Mark's gospel, Jesus was committed to training his disciples with a particular focus on the 12 apostles. And it's clear from this story that he was only interested in teaching them the truth of God's word, that he had no time for the traditions of the elders. Jesus didn't respond to the Pharisees question in verse five. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? But the answer might well have been because I haven't taught them your traditions. Although they're described in the book of Acts as ordinary unschooled men, the disciples were not ignorant about God's law. Peter would later declare that he had never eaten anything unclean in all his life. But they didn't seem to know about the traditions of the elders. And it seems that Jesus was happy to keep it that way. This may have been particularly important for Mark, who was writing, we think, to the church in Rome, a fellowship made up of believers from both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. Now, as we know from the book of Acts and the letters of the New Testament, the early church had to deal with a lot of pressure from people who insisted that Christians should follow the Jewish law. So Mark's comment in verse 19 is probably a word of clarification for the believers in Rome, reinforcing the official letters that were circulating at the time that told the early churches not to worry about following the Old Testament food laws. After all, says Mark, Jesus declared all foods clean. So don't get taken in by those who are wanting to impose the old restrictions. One other thing to note here, it seems that the disciples were really slow to understand what Jesus was saying. Was anyone else slightly surprised by Jesus' words in verse 18? Are you so dull? Don't you get it? Maybe the disciples found it hard to see what Jesus was getting at because they'd been brought up to consider certain foods unclean. It was difficult for them to let go of what they had been taught since childhood, Old Testament food laws, which had been observed for generations. But was Jesus expecting a little bit more from them? They'd been with him now for some time. They'd heard him preach about the kingdom of God, a new era. They'd heard him teach about the need for new wineskins, new ways of doing things in the new era but it's hard to let go of what we hold dear.
Or maybe it was simply that Jesus expected them to see the age old truth that the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at their outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That can be the same for us, can't it? Especially when we've been used to certain things for many years or particular traditions and ways of doing things. It can be difficult to let go of them. Equally, we can focus too much on externals. I was going to say, particularly in this media fueled image, crazy celebrity, celebrity driven world. But actually, this has always been and I think always will be a problem for God's people in every culture. In Cambodia, um, in the early days of Portion Thong Church, when we were looking for and, and selecting and training leaders, one of the elders said, oh, do you know what, Bora, he should be an, he should be an elder in the church. And he was quite new, uh, a new Christian, maybe hadn't even perhaps been baptized at that point. And we were like, wow, what do you see in him? What do you see in him that, that, that would make him a great leader? And she said, I should be an elder because he's so tall and handsome. Now, in the end, he did mature into a really great Christian man, husband, father and leader. We don't look at the outside, do we? We look at the heart like God does. Jesus wanted to ensure that the disciples understood the truth about what makes a person clean or unclean. He wanted to ensure that the disciples could discern between the truth of God's word and the tradition of the elders. And he wanted to ensure that the disciples would be equipped to hand down that truth rather than the man-made rules of the day. And this begs the question, what are we handing down and passing on to others? Truth or tradition? Because we need to be wary of the same dangers, the same things that Jesus highlighted here. Letting go of the word of God. We must be careful that extra biblical traditions do not cause us to let go of the word of God. The Pharisees may have begun making up their rules in order to help people, but it soon became a burden. Our traditions, our extra biblical rules can do the same. They may have been made in good faith, but now they are hindering faith or holding the church back. What about setting aside the word of God? Well, we must be careful not to set one scripture against another in order to suit our worldview or culture. It can be easy to set up or hold on to the rules or traditions that we're comfortable with and to defend them as biblical, even though the clear testimony of the whole of scripture points in a different direction. Setting aside the word of God like this can lead to a sub-biblical approach to life. And we miss out on so much of what God wants for us, for his church, and for his world. How about nullifying the word of God? We must be careful not to ignore the word of God just because it's costly. The Pharisees effectively declared the fifth commandment null and void in order to sidestep its financial obligations. We might ask, what parts of scripture are we tempted to ignore or to declare invalid because we're afraid of what it might cost us to stand up for the truth? What happens here is that we can create rules that justify non-biblical behavior. That's been a problem for the church through the generations and is still acute today. Well, there are obvious examples of all three of these dangers around us. So we're really grateful for the Holy Spirit who guides us into truth and for the gifts of the spirit that God gives the church, such as wisdom and discernment, so that we can work out what to hold on to and what to hand down and what to let go of and avoid. Now it's worth saying again that tradition can be good, helpful and beneficial. In fact, we don't seem to be able to last too long without tradition. Like the church planting workshop I was at in Cambodia a few years ago. We worship together each morning as part of the course and one of the trainers led us on the first morning. He explained that when you plant a church, one of the best things is that you can be free from all the traditions of the past. He wasn't very keen on traditions. So we said, let's just sing a few songs. Who wants to suggest something? We sang a few songs. He led a prayer. We did a Bible study. 
It was good. Well, the next day, one of the participants was asked to lead the worship. She began, let's sing a few songs. Any suggestions? And we sang a few songs. She led a prayer. We did a Bible study and it was good. On the third day, another of the participants led us. He said, let's just sing a few songs. And the tradition had been born. But the point is not whether or not we have tradition. The challenge is to keep it in proper perspective. As Donald English says in his commentary, the test is not whether all conform to the same pattern, but whether each in its own setting is true to the scripture it claims to interpret and to the requirement of inner purity. We do well in the interests of these to hold lightly to our traditions. It was this that Jesus' hearers found so hard to accept. So where does that leave us this morning? Well, there's lots for us to think about, both individually and as a church. But particularly, perhaps, if you've been hurt by people who imposed extra biblical rules on you in the past, or if you're struggling with guilt because you feel like you're not living up to the standards of others, maybe there's a special word for you this morning. To be free from the expectations that are imposed on us by tradition and man-made rules. And to know that all God wants from you is to hold on to his word and to walk in his ways. You may be striving to make yourself acceptable to God by trying to do all the right things like those Pharisees. You may even be feeling like a bit of a fraud. You look good on the outside, but actually, you know that your heart is not right with God. Well, lay all that aside this morning and come to Jesus. Ask him to purify your heart and make you holy. You don't need to do anything extra to be made clean and acceptable to God. His grace is enough. Just acknowledge that your heart is the problem and ask God to cleanse you from your sin. It really is that simple, which is brilliant and reassuring because our eternal well-being is at stake. And the truth is that Jesus and only Jesus can make us clean, acceptable to God and safe forever. And when it comes to following Jesus, you don't need to do anything more than we see in the Bible. No extra man-made rules, no special codes or rituals. The word of God contains all the facts you need for life. And that's what our last song is all about. It's a prayer that the word of God would dwell richly in our hearts so that our lives are a blessing to those around us. Let's sing together. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. <laughs>